that was it for the exams. Um, uh, I just wanted to put this up here that my lab is recruiting for the summer. So we're going to recruit somebody who's a full time. So if you're a graduating senior and you don't have plans for next year, you're going to put off medical school or whatever. Or you, maybe you want to go to grad school, but you're not really sure. Um, we're hiring so, uh, to start the summer. And uh, first of all, so that might apply to some of you. Um, and then we're also looking for new undergraduate research assistants to start in the summer. Um, typically, we look for people who are rising sophomores or rising juniors. Um, maybe in some circumstances, a rising senior, you're going to you know, put in the time, motivated this summer. Uh, but if you know anybody who would be interested in that, just have them contact me. Anyway. All right. So, let's see. So um, 
here, uh, we can also take a weak stimulus. So a strong stimulus um, elicits a response, <coughs> and a weak stimulus, which is this uh, point right here, um, doesn't elicit much of a response. <coughs> okay. The strong stimulus alone can strengthen itself, okay. but if you co-activate um, the strong and the weak at the same time, the, um, the effect of the strong can also enhance the weak. Okay, so if you elicit a strong response and a weak response, you can get enhancement of the weak response along with the strong response. Whereas the weak response by itself doesn't elicit enough depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. Okay, and this is how if you co-activate those two. You get strengthening of them both, which associates them together. Okay, so now they're, uh, both inputs are associated with the output of the, the post Okay. So this is kind of the cartoon for that. Um, specificity is if you get uh, strengthening in the active synapse, but no strengthening in the inactive synapse, so there was no neurotransmitter release here. Whereas associativity, you get very strong stimulation uh, of, those, of the strong input um, that elicits um, uh, 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 strengthening of the weak stimulation at the same time. So remember we had this dual um, uh, requirement. You had to have neurotransmitter release and you had to have synaptic depolarization. Okay. And so that's uh, <coughs> being, that requirement is being fulfilled at this synapse because you're getting neurotransmitter release and depolarization, it's just that the depolarization is because of other <coughs> um, But the timing of this is really crucial. These have to be coinciding in time. If you sort of alternate them, uh, it doesn't work. Okay. So just, just be clear that at this synapse, in this condition, there's no neurotransmitter release uh, occurring here, and in this condition, there's neurotransmitter release because of the, the weak stimulation. Okay, so we've talked a lot about how to make synapses stronger, how to make those responses bigger, okay? But basically what goes up must come down. You can't just continuously strengthen, strengthen, strengthen all of your synapses or even subsets of your synapses kind of endlessly. Um, so there's two things. One thing is that you know, there's sort of a limit to how big you can make individual synapses, uh, but also that uh, you can also weaken synapses. And this is a phenomenon known as uh, long-term depression. So long-term association, long-term depression. <coughs> and this is what's known as bidirectional regulation um, of synaptic strength. So here's an example of a paradigm where we're going to uh, show you how to <coughs> long-term depression. Okay, so again, we have the CA3 to CA1 connection, uh, stimulating uh, the Schaffer collaterals and recording in the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so at the baseline level, we're stimulating at just a very, very uh, slow rate. So every 10 seconds, every 20 seconds. So kind of a 0.1-ish hertz. Okay, and then you're recording the response. So this is your baseline. Now at this time point, you start um, stimulating at a higher rate. It's still not as high as a tetanus. A so tetanus is like 100, 100 hertz or so or more. Here we're stimulating at one hertz, so once every second. Um, you'll notice that there's an increase here. Uh, this is due to short-term facilitation. Okay, so you're stimulating frequently enough to elicit maybe residual calcium, and that boosts the uh, the response temporarily, and then eventually that declines. Okay, through other short-term mechanisms. Okay, it goes back down the baseline, even though you're continuously stimulating for one hertz. So if you do this for long enough, this is a 15-minute time to go and then stop, and then start stimulating at that original slow baseline rate, what you find is that the response is much lower. Okay, And this is known as long-term depression. Okay, So whether the synaptic strength goes up or goes down depends on precisely how you're stimulating the pathways. Okay. <coughs> um, confusingly, both of these rely on a calcium. So here's a comparable um, uh, formation of, of LTD. Um, again, you have neurotransmitter <coughs> release. Again, you have sufficient depolarization so that you have a calcium influx. Uh, but instead of causing receptor insertion, 
you have receptor internalization. So these receptors are being taken away <coughs> from the membrane. So it's exactly the opposite of uh, what was going on in LTP. Okay, so people are still trying to figure out exactly <coughs> how does the cell know uh, what level of calcium you need in order to get one versus the other. And so it's not a simple linear um, function of calcium where low calcium, no change, and then as you increase the calcium, you get uh, uh, potentiation. There's sort of an in-between regime where you can get depression as well. People are still kind of figuring out the, uh, the details there. And it has to do with you know, precisely which proteins get phosphorylated uh, and uh, you know, which, uh, which effectors uh, those go on to, to, uh, to elicit. Is depression triggered at a higher level? Yeah, so, so you don't. So the question is, is depression triggered at higher levels of calcium or lower levels of calcium? Or, you know, how is it different? So, um, so I was just trying to make that point that it's not really clear exactly how that works. Um, it may be that, that the, uh, the timing, that you, if you have a very large but transient increase of calcium, you know, and I'm kind of I'm waving my hands here because it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, but generally, we can look at the stimulation paradigm and look at a tetanus will probably, you know, short tetanus will elicit a very rapid rise in mm -hmm. calcium uh, that then probably also uh, goes down again, whereas, you know, along the long, low frequency stimulation probably elicits less calcium, but over a longer time period. So it may be the <coughs> concentration, the peak, the timing, um, all of those factors. We're sort of not gonna, not gonna really get into that. Um, okay, so just to kind of summarize these long-term forms of plasticity, LTP is a form of synaptic enhancement that's associated with learning. Um, and there's a bunch of variations. We have talked about dependency <coughs> on NMDR receptors as the coincidence that there's <coughs> calcium with the influx. Um, there are other forms of LTP that don't depend on NMDR receptors, that take metatotropic receptors, for example. Um, and I just want you to sort of be aware that there are other things. We're going to talk about spike timing dependent LTP in just a minute. Um, but the classic stimulus to elicit LTP is this tetanus, this sort of short, high frequency stimulus. LTD is the opposite, synaptic strength reduction um, or extinction, um, because you have to wonder what would happen if you only had LTP. So everybody kind of knew there must be another mechanism that reduced synaptic strength. And the classic stimulus associated with this is this sort of one hertz uh, long, low frequency stimulation. Um, there's another form of uh, long term changes in synapses that's kind of become the rage in the last 10 years or so. And this is known as synaptic scaling. And in this case, and this may be related also to, to LTD. So in synaptic scaling, the idea is that you, know, you have these changes in uh, synaptic strength. You strengthen a bunch of your synapses, okay, and at <coughs> some point, you're basically going to saturate the input to a neuron, and it needs to kind of scale everything back down. And so what happens is you get specific strengthening of synapses. The neuron realizes that its overall balance is a little high, and then it takes all of the synapses and scales it back down or the reverse. If you produce synapses too much and it's not getting enough input, it'll scale everything up. And the important thing is that it keeps the differences between you know, the strong inputs and the weak inputs relatively uh, relative to each other. That ratio is important. Okay, so that's all we're going to say about the synaptic scale. But it's probably a really important thing. Okay, and then we're going to talk about one last form of plasticity, which is a form of LTP. Uh, where we're not going to use this you know, really sort of powerful crude tetanus uh, type of input. Instead, we're going to use um, more precision. So we talked a little bit earlier about uh, Hebbian plasticity, where if you have coincidence of activity in the presynaptic and the postsynaptic, you get synapse strengthening, neurons that fire together, wire together. Okay, and this is sort of a literal incarnation of that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about timing. So 
what scale of time are we talking about? We're talking about on a scale of milliseconds. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's look at that. So in this paradigm, we have, say, a single presynaptic neuron okay, and a single postsynaptic neuron. We're part of them both. And if you elicit a spike in the presynaptic neuron, okay, uh, where is this? Sorry, this is a, sorry, this is a recording in the postsynaptic cell. So this is postsynaptic membrane potential. Okay, and we can control the timing of the presynaptic action potential, and therefore EPSC, EPSB in the postsynaptic cell, and uh, elicit a spike in the postsynaptic cell as well. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, so this is a case where we're eliciting the presynaptic uh, response. So there's a spike in the postsynaptic cell that causes an EPSP <coughs> postsynaptic cell. And here we're eliciting a spike in the postsynaptic cell. <coughs> so, so you're doing two stimuli, and the pre precedes the post by a few milliseconds. Right? This is on the time scale. Of okay, and when you do that, um, you get a strengthening of the synapse. So here, uh, Oh, that's 20 milliseconds. So here at 20 milliseconds, if you measure the amplitude of the EPSC after you've done this, par this par pairing paradigm, uh, you get a uh, potentiation of the response. Now you can vary the timing of the pre relative to the post. So you can do it 10 milliseconds ahead, 20 milliseconds ahead, 30 milliseconds ahead, and you get strengthening. But if you start doing the presynaptic <coughs> stimulus, after you've done the postsynaptic stimulus, um, it doesn't work. Okay. And that's shown here. That now, if you uh, elicit a spike in the postsynaptic cell, and then wait a few milliseconds, and then elicit an EPSP, you can actually get uh, a decrease in the response um, of the of the uh, of the EPSP. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Um, sorry, this is, this is the. Uh, sorry, let me back up one more. Time. So this is uh, similar to the LTP, where this is our baseline. Here we're doing a pairing paradigm, mm -hmm. and then this is time after the pairing paradigm. Sorry. Next, another couple of graphs. We're going to show you the relative time. Okay. In all of this case, uh, during this uh, this stimulation paradigm, you're doing uh, multiple pairs of pre prior to the post. Okay. And then when you measure afterwards, over time, you're getting uh, an enhancement of the response. Okay. So this is the time over the, the course of the experiment. Did I fix that? Is that clear? Okay. Let me know. If okay. So here's a different experiment. Um, here's your baseline EPSP. Here you're stimulating, but now you've reversed the timing so that the postsynaptic action potential arrives or the presynaptic EPSP. And then when you measure after that pairing paradigm, the EPSP is um, smaller. So this is longer compression. Okay, so now we're going to vary the timing of that. So we showed pre versus, sorry, pre before post, and then we showed post before pre, but we can vary this timing. Okay, and that's what this graph is. Sorry. So this graph is a summary of many of these experiments where we varied the timing. Okay. And so each of these points is one uh, experiment. How much did the EPSP increase or decrease based on the relative timing of the presynaptic and postsynaptic activity? Okay. So if it's presynaptic arrives before the postsynaptic action potential, you get an enhancement. Okay. And this happens you know, within 10 to 20 milliseconds here, you get the largest enhancement. If you wait too long, then there's no enhancement. So that's the same as basically having no correlation between the activity in the pre versus post. If you reverse the, uh, the relative timing, so now the post fires an action potential before the presynaptic EPSP, you can get depression of the EPSP. And again, if you wait long enough, 
there's no response. So you get this kind of um, you know, bi-directional plasticity based on the very precise timing of those inputs. And so now I just kind of want you to imagine a brain that's just kind of firing along, getting lots of inputs that all have their own timing, and these neurons have to kind of sort this out. And this is kind of how they do it, that they uh, analyze the timing of their own activity relative to the timing of those synaptic inputs. Using, and it all falls out of the mechanism So that's long term initiation. And we're going to move on to today's lecture. kind of three topics in this lecture. Um, axon guidance, just a little bit. We're not really a development neuro course, so we're just going to cover it a little bit. Um, we're going to cover um, a little bit about uh, target choice. How do, how do axons know where to project um, and how to project in their, um, in their target? And how does this relate to topographic mapping? Remember, we talked a lot about sensory systems having you know, a map of uh, receptive fields, you know, with somatic, uh, somatotopic maps, um, visual maps, and so on. Um, and so how do you set up um, that kind of mapping in the first place? Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about uh, growth uh, and refinement. Um, okay, so this is just kind of a summary of what kinds of signals are involved in creating neural circuits. We're going to have a very cursory look. If you look in your textbook, there's sort of an endless list of molecules and systems that are involved. And if you're interested, you can look at that. But let's just kind of pare it down into classes of molecules. So you have um, uh, this little cartoon. Is the idea is that you have axons <coughs> that have uh, growth cones on the end. So these are little motile cones that are moving along, extending, trying to figure out where they belong. And you need a way to channel uh, the, the propagation of those. Okay. And so there's a number of different uh, options. There are molecules that line the pathways that either attract or repulse axons, just to kind of keep them in line. You have um, attractive molecules, so growth cones that are trying to grow toward um, a chemoattractant. You have repulsion molecules. Um, these are often diffusible molecules that are laid down with gradients. Okay, so you can have repulsion, so the axon, the growth cones basically turn away and grow in another direction. Um, and then we'll talk about a class of molecules that once the growth cones reach their targets, uh, basically maintains them, keeps them going. Okay, uh, it's very important. So the molecules that are used in axon guidance um, have several different characteristics. Um, a, num a number of them are uh, highly localized. They're either sort of in the extracellular matrix or anchored in support cells. Um, they have transmembrane. Some of them are transmembrane expressed. So these are not attached to membranes per se. They're in the extracellular matrix. These are um, expressed in the membranes of other cells, either partner neurons or Port cells, um, and then there's a class of molecules that are diffusible, so they, they're just in this extracellular medium and they can sort of float around, uh, whereas the matrix proteins tend to be anchored uh, in the extracellular matrix. Okay, and then um, obviously we talked about attractive versus repulsive, um, and we're not really going to get into this, but it's basically uh, it goes through second messenger pathways that cause um, the growth cones to either collapse or continue to expand. Okay, so I thought we would talk about um, one particular uh, guidance molecule. Out of the dozens or so we could be talking about. <coughs> but this one was interesting because this is a class of guidance molecules 
that are involved in the topographic mapping um, that we're going to talk about. So, so the idea here is these are um, uh, what's called the Efren system. So you have uh, Efren, which is often uh, referred to as the ligand, and F, which are the receptors. Um, the Efrens are membrane bound, uh, but tend to be sort of shorter little molecules, and they have an extracellular domain. That extracellular domain interacts with the F receptor, which is this larger protein, uh, which is actually a member of the tyrosine kinase receptors. So remember, there's just an enormous super family of, of tyrosine kinase receptors, and this is one of them. And there's a number of sub members of this family, like <coughs> 16 or so different types of, of receptors. But generally, we're just going to consider this efferin is the ligand, and F is the receptor. And what's kind of interesting about the system is, unlike most sort of ligand receptor systems, uh, you can get signaling that goes in both directions. So both the cell that's expressing the efferin and that's expect expressing the F, uh, both have second messenger uh, signaling uh, that can carry on the signal. So when you get two neurons together, or two cells together that have matching ligands, both of those cells know it. What's really important here, I just wanted to kind of highlight with the red boxes you know, what I want you to remember um, on this kind of complicated, complicated graph. Okay, and so what's interesting is that there was a, a long time system, the, uh, what's known as the retinotectal system, which has been kind of a paradigm of development for decades and decades. Um, <coughs> and people eventually figured out that, aha, the effort system is involved in this, in this path-making uh, system. Okay, so uh, some of the early work uh, was defined in frogs, um, and uh, this is also true of fish, uh, and this is called the retinotactyl system. So you have the retina, just like all the other animals, but the projection uh, target for the retina in frogs and uh, fish and uh, birds is called the tectum. Okay, this is roughly analogous to the superior colliculus in uh, mammals, uh, but this is you know, fundamentally what these animals see with. They don't really have a, a visual cortex, per se. Um, so this is the fundamental pathway. Um, OK, and just like uh, um, in humans, there is a, uh, there's a temporal path. Uh, there's a temporal part of the eye and a nasal part of the eye. Remember, frogs are sort of have their eyes positioned at very laterally. Okay, but there's a division between the, the temporal retina and the nasal retina. And this shows in where they project. There's a retinotopic projection onto the tectum. Okay. And so this projection uh, is that the temporal retinal axons project to the anterior part of the tectum, whereas the nasal uh, retina project to the posterior. And I'm going to recommend that you learn this in terms of temporal and nasal. Uh, it's a little confusing to call each of these anterior and posterior. So temporal goes to anterior tectum, nasal goes to posterior tectum. Okay, so back in the 1950s, when people were trying to figure out how this retinotopic projection was set up, they did a number of experiments, and uh, amphibians, um, is an interesting system because you can basically crush uh, the nerve groups and uh, they'll grow back. Okay. Unlike lots of mammalian systems, you get a lot of regeneration in these kinds of animals. And so the experiment was to take the frog's eye, um, cut the auditory, the auditory, the optic nerve, and rotate the eye in the socket, put it back in, and let it regrow. And the question was, are the you know formerly nasal now temporal retina uh, axons going to grow to their original target? Are they going to grow to the target of their current position? Now to flip the eye. Okay. And so you're testing a hypothesis here. You're testing whether the retinal neurons intrinsically have some knowledge of where they're supposed to project. Or is it a positional signal that 
once the retina has been flipped, the formerly nasal neurons say, aha, now I'm temporal, and I'm going to project to the temporal uh, target in the tendon. And so this is a way to test uh, a hypothesis. Okay. And it turns out that, the, uh, that when you do this manipulation, that the retinal axon regrows to their original location in the tectum. <coughs> so an originally nasal retina, which is now temporal, will still project to its original target. And so this was proposed to, to suggest a uh, what they call chemoaffinity hypothesis. So the idea is that every neuron has a little tag, some sort of chemical tag that tells it where it needs to project. Okay, and the original hypothesis was proposed as sort of a locking key target. You know, that every retina has a particular spot. Um, and it has a little key, and it has to go, and only where it can fit its key into the lock is when it ends up. Okay. This turned out to be not quite right, which you could probably guess from theoretical grounds, because you have to have such an enormous number of keys and locks in order to get the kind of uh, targeting that you get. And it turns out that what's really happening is, some, is a sort of gradient-based uh, uh, paradigm. And it's where you have both uh, affinity and repulsion signals, depending on you know, which, um, which system you're looking at. So in terms of those F receptors that I said were involved in the topographic mapping, um, it's actually a, uh, a repulsion signal. Okay, And it works like this. And we're just going to talk about sort of one ephrin and f receptor pair. There are lots of different pairings that could be happening. We're going to talk about this one particular pair. OK, we're going to call it the FA receptors. And the idea is that in the retina, the axons express a range of F receptors. So they express F receptors, but the temporal, res the temporal <coughs> retina expresses uh, has a higher expression of these receptors than the nasal retina. The tectum, on the other hand, expresses the ligand, ephrine, and it also has a gradient. Okay. The posterior part of the tectum expresses a higher density of the ephrine ligands than the anterior. Okay. This means that when you have temporal retina that have lots of uh, F receptors are growing into the tectum, <coughs> As they grow along, they're basically going to hit a spot where there's too much ephrin. Okay, so they're going to stop in the anterior. If they continue on toward the posterior, they're going to get repulsed because they've got lots of receptors and there's too much ephrin, and they're going to stop. Um, the nasal retina, on the other hand, have far fewer receptors, so they will project farther into the tectum. Um, and then uh, stop somewhere in the posterior area. Okay, so they're more tolerant of higher levels of the ligand. <laughs> Just double check that. They have lots of receptors. They have fewer receptors, so they're more tolerant of high levels of the ligand. Okay, and this and this works because it's a it's a repulsion. So we can also see this in um, another experiment, sort of same system, we're in the chick rather than the frog now, but it's basically the same idea, that if you take, um, uh, sort of take the tectum, cut it in half, kind of crush up the anterior part, and crush up the posterior part, and basically paint stripes on a petri dish, okay? And that's what's shown here. So this is an anterior stripe, Here's a posterior stripe, anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior. Okay, so you have these dishes, these stripes. And then you plate <coughs> on one plate the temporal axons. So these are the temporal retina axons. The temporal axons, which remember express high levels of the receptor, are going to stick to their lane in the anterior lanes. Right? So anterior is where we have low ligand, posterior is where we have high ligand. They're going to avoid the lanes that have lots of ligands. 
And this is how we know it's this, this repulsion signal. So these temporal axons are going to stay in their lane. The nasal axons that are expressing a lot less of the receptor just kind of go wherever they want, right? So they'll go in the anterior lanes because they don't know any better. They'll go in the posterior lanes because they'll tolerate relatively high levels. So that's the F uh, receptor system and the retinotectal projection. And now we're going to talk a little bit about neurotrophins. Okay, so that was pathfinding. Now we're going to talk about basically survival. So once neurons get to where they're going, um, there are molecules there that ensure that they are happy. Okay. Uh, and this was um, uh, early work by uh, Rita Levi Monticini. Um, who was working in sort of World War II Italy. Um, and she was banned from the university um, and basically kind of working with chicks, uh, chick systems, chicken eggs, uh, out of the kitchen in World War II Italy. And uh, despite that, um, she and her collaborators uh, discovered a neurotherapy called nerve growth factor. Okay, so the experiments that they were looking at were using uh, sympathetic ganglion from chicks in culture. And they were trying to figure out what kind of molecules would support outgrowth. And ultimately, they found that nerve growth factor was necessary. If you don't have nerve growth factor, um, you have the, this is like a little dark ball of uh, neurons in a, in a culture dish. And they weren't surviving in the culture dish. They weren't growing out of this culture. If you apply NGF, all of a sudden you get this, um, you know, what looks like this, this hairball are basically axons growing out of <coughs> the gangway. So it's promoting their survival and outgrowth. Um, this is a little plot that shows that as you increase the NGF concentration, you get increased survival. This is uh, a little cut through uh, one of these uh, types of ganglion that if you don't have NGF, they die. And with NGF, you have a nice, healthy ganglion. So these are growth factors that have a positive effect on the survival of these neurons. Um, and the term for this is trophic. So that's why they're called uh, neurotrophins. Okay, so these neurotrophins have a class of receptors. Um, the neurotrophins themselves tend to be uh, diffusible molecules that are released. Um, and then these molecules <coughs> contact a class of receptors called TREK, TRK. Uh, is yet another family from this tyrosine receptor, tyrosine kinase receptor family. Um, and then, you know, a miracle happens, all these, there's a whole range of intracellular signaling um, that support a whole range of, um, of activity. But in particular, it supports neurite outgrowth, okay, so those little axons coming out, um, and maintenance, uh, cell survival, um, and also can enhance plasticity. All right, so we've talked about chemoattractive and chemorepulsive molecules involved in axon guidance and pathfinding, um, and how that relates to mapping. Uh, we talked just about neurotrophins, and now we're going to talk more about um, <coughs> how do you get the very sort of specific connections that we need in order to have a functional nervous system. Okay, and this is uh, termed experiment, um, experience dependent uh, refinement or experience dependent uh, plasticity. So the idea is that this, you, know, you have these, path, these gradients of pathfinding and general projection, but it's a very coarse mapping, right? And now you need to, to refine, um, uh, refine the mapping. Here's kind of two cartoon examples that show that if you look early in development uh, in something like uh, neuromuscular junction, um, or this is uh, sort of a ganglion, su ganglion system. This is, uh, this is one of these uh, those monopolar cells in, say, the ciliary ganglia. These are neurons that don't have dendrites. Um, it's a very crude cartoon, just so that you understand. So this is a cell body and then the axon, and then it's receiving synaptic inputs. Okay. But the basic idea is that um, each of these targets 
is receiving multiple inputs, okay? And each of these axons <coughs> is making multiple connections. So sort of a very crude uh, mapping uh, of these inputs, and not very specific. And then over time, uh, with experience and maturity, these connections are refined so that you know a single muscle fiber uh, receives an input, and the input contacts a single muscle fiber, uh, for example. Um, and likewise uh, for these inputs. So, you know, in certain cases, you have very, very precise uh, mapping of um, axons to the target. Here's an example of an experiment that looked at this um, over time. Uh, so, in this case, there's um, uh, this is the neuromuscular. Yes, this is neuromuscular junction. So, uh, the red kind of underneath uh, the green and the blue is the acetylcholine receptors. Mm -hmm. So, this is a synaptic connection in the neuromuscular junction, and you have two separate axons. So, these are two axons that have been separately labeled: one green, one blue. And you can see where they're trying to contact, and basically kind of muscle in on those postsynaptic receptors. So, they're competing for space. And over time, so P11 is postnatal day 11, up to P15, and basically they're duking it out, and eventually the green wins, and the blue axon actually retracts. Okay. So competitive. Okay. And so this is there's sort of a general pattern here that you have an overproduction of inputs that you can have uh, many to one convergence. So a single postnatal target gets lots of different inputs, many, uh, many potential axons. The axons actually can branch out and have many contacts. Um, and then eventually, through competitive activity, you prune these down to just um, a specific number of contacts. Yes? Are we going to learn more about the competitive activity the blue determines why? Yes. Are we going to learn more about this competition? And the answer is yes. That's pretty much what the rest of the, uh, the lecture is going to be. Okay. Okay. And then there's two types of, of um, reduction in these contacts. Uh, what's called pruning, which is a loss of the synaptic connection, and then um, uh, calling, uh, which is uh, basically that if you, these axons don't have, if they never win, and they don't have any sort of trophic interactions with its target, but they die. Okay, so you actually get elimination not only of synapses, but also of neurons. Okay, and clearly experience and activity is a really crucial component for this. Okay, and so basically we can kind of take what we learned about LTP and apply it to our experience kind of plasticity. And we're going to look at this in the context of uh, visual development. So you're going to have to remember your vision circuits. Uh, so go back. If you don't remember it, go back and, uh, and look over this. OK, but just to review, um, remember that we have uh, the retinal axons that project to the lateral geniculate nucleus. OK? And then, of course, the LGN projects to <coughs> the visual cortex. And remember, we talked a lot about how the, uh, the visual information from one half of the visual field needs to be processed on the opposite side of the brain. And as a result, you have the temporal axons <coughs> from, one, from one eye project ipsilaterally to LGN. And the nasal axons from the other eye project contralaterally to LGN. So you have these two sets of inputs. So the LGN is receiving inputs from both eyes, okay? But in the LGN, these inputs are completely segregated. Okay, so if you look at the, um, the projections, the, um, the contralateral projections are in blue, so you have these layers in the LGN that are strictly contralateral, and the layers that are strictly ipsilateral. Remember, ipsilateral, same side, contralateral, opposite <coughs> side. Okay. And then when they project into the V1, okay, you have projections from the LGN to the input layer is this layer four of 
the, the striated cortex. Okay? And they're still segregated. You have alternating stripes of contralateral and lateral visual input. Okay? Uh, and that's in layer four. Now, layer four neurons project to uh, what we call the supergranular layers, layer two and three, and uh, this strict segregation uh, uh, is modified a little bit. Now you have intermixing of left and right eye, ipsilateral and contralateral eye, and this is where you get uh, binocularity. So you start to have neurons that respond to both left and right eye inputs. Okay. But those have to be in register, right? If you have an, a, an, a neuron that's getting input from your left eye, and it's also getting input from your right eye, if those inputs are from different parts of the visual field, that's a problem, right? So those have to be coordinated somehow. And these processes are um, involved in creating that kind, of, that kind of mapping. So you have specific spatial mapping of these binocular um, responses. Okay, but let's look at um, you know, how we know all this. So these are some, uh, some great experiments back from uh, Hubel and Weasel. Remember we talked about them in terms of reporting from uh, visual cortical cells, the simple cells, and complex cells. Well, they also did these tracing experiments, these classic tracing experiments, where they basically <coughs> injected um, a radio-labeled dye into one of the eyes left the other eye unlabeled. And uh, it turns out that this particular labeling system processes synapse. Okay, so it gets taken up into the ganglion cells, goes to the thalamus where it's transferred to the thalamocortical neurons, and then it's observed in the cortex. Okay, so here's, this, I, I love this little cartoon. This is just such a cute cartoon of this big syringe stabbing the eye, <laughs> opening the little flap in the brain. Okay, so when you look at the brain, you can see the differences between the labeled eye and the unlabeled eye. So in the LGN, it looks like this. Okay, this is just like our cartoon. Um, the uh, the uh, layers that receive the ipsilateral inputs, so the injection was in one eye, and so ipsilateral to that injected eye, um, you get the, um, the labeling. Okay, and then lack of labeling in the contralateral. And then if you look at the cortex, you see this sort of zebra stripe of ocular dominance. So these are the ocular dominance mapping. Um, and we're looking at the surface of the map. So remember we talked about cortical columns. So if we go vertically into the map, you will also see the ocular dominance, right? So that's an example of the cortical columns that we talked about. Okay, and so here the, um, the light are the ipsilateral and the dark. You know, and they're not, it's interesting, they're not like perfect stripes, it's sort of this zebra stripe kind of thing. Okay, and we know that these require activity uh, in order to properly form, because if you take activity away uh, using what we call monocular deprivation, so either you, you know, uh, in inject TTX or suture over the eye, if you take activity away, and you really disrupt the ocular dominance column. So now you have um, uh, you have monocular deprivation. You close one eye, inject the other. The non-deprived eye, the one that's open and active, basically takes over uh, an enormous amount of the real estate in the V1. And the, the interpretation is that you need activity in order to uh, uh, get a balance of the input into okay. uh, and here we're basically looking at uh, uh, layer four, okay. looking through layer two, we're looking at layer four uh, projections. Okay, and we said that in layer four that you have this very clean uh, segregation of input from the two eyes, and we said that the projection from layer four to layer two, three, you basically start to get uh, binocular <coughs> responses. So to sort of refine our idea of how activity is affecting this sort of mapping, we're going to shift our attention to the supergranular layers, uh, typically layer two, three, um, and um, 
we're going to consider how these uh, how these neurons respond to input from either eye, and then perform our manipulations. Okay. So we go from strict segregation to where we have an intermixing of input from both eyes. Here's kind of another map. So again, here's the ocular dominance mapping. Uh, but if you record, so now we're going to switch to an electrophysiological test. Instead of the radio label test, we're going to stick an electrode in and shine light in either eye and see which eye, uh, into which eye, you, oh, which eye that's activated activates the neuron in V1. I said that badly, but I think you get where I'm going with this. We record from the neuron in uh, position A here. So this is sort of a horizontal distance across the uh, this, this stripe here. OK, so you record from this neuron. And it tends to respond most when you stimulate the contralateral eye. Okay. So sort of plotted on the, the vertical axis here is uh, what we'll call ocular dominance or preference, so contra preference is plotted on this end, and ipsilateral preference is plotted on this end. So you have a position where you have contra preference, and then you have a position where it'll respond to light in either eye. So left, it'll respond, right, it'll respond, does both. Um, and then you move over a little bit and you record from a cell that responds only when you shine light into the ipsilateral eye, not in the contra eye. Okay. So you, in this way, if you move along, Okay, so you move along these stripes, and you can get a, um, sort of a consistent change in the preference uh, of uh, which eye it prefers to be, uh, prefers to be uh, activated. All right, so we can create a little histogram. So we do lots of recordings. Okay, we'll create a little histogram of how many cells preferred contra, how many preferred ipsilateral, and how many responded to both? Okay, and so um, so this is a typical histogram, and that you have the number of cells activated versus the uh, what we call the ocular dominance um, scale. So one means it prefers contra, just like this neuron. Seven means it prefers ipsilateral, like that neuron. Um, and then there's a whole bunch that are sort of in between. Okay, so these are sort of genuinely binocular neurons in that layer two, three. Okay, so this is what it looks like in sort of a normal animal where you sample across um, the range of, of cortex. Okay, so here um, at the top of these next few slides um, is a little diagram that kind of describes the experiment. Okay, here are the eyes. Okay, here is kind of a timeline. Okay, so here's birth at zero. And then say we're measuring the ocular dominance of a population of neurons at uh, uh, what is this, month 38. So these are adult animals. Okay, so very long experiments. Okay, so in the normal cat, where both the eyes are open and it's developing normally, um, we get an ocular dominance histogram that looks like this, where we have binocular cells. And they're a little biased toward the contralateral. There's a little bit more in the, toward the contralateral than toward the lateral. Okay. Uh, this is down here just is saying that you're presenting light to, to the two eyes. Okay, so now we're going to perform our manipulation just like Hugh and Weasel did with their radio labeled ocular dominance columns. We're going to deprive one eye at birth. Okay, so cat, this is in cats. Cats open their eyes in about a week or so. So at that about that time, you basically suture one eye shut and leave the other eye open. Leave it that way for about uh, two and a half months. Let them grow up, uh, perform experiments in the adult animal, and you get a huge shift in the distribution of ocular preference. And it's toward the non-deprived eye. Okay. So here the eye is uh, contralateral that's been sutured shut. And so basically, you've gotten rid of all of those contralateral parts. So if you shine light in the contralateral eye, it doesn't see it. Totally unaware. 
and you have all of these neurons that are responsive only to the ipsilateral eye, which was the, the one that was left over. Okay, so again, this is showing that you need that activity in order to get normal. Yes. No, no, that's okay. Um, so then, so the tissues then connecting the from the eye that's super closed. Are those neurons? They're just not active. They're programmed towards the other eye. So then, did they do an experiment when they reopen the eye? Okay. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Okay, but to, to answer the first part of your question is, uh, we're looking at cortical neurons. What's happening below? Um, if you record from the LGN or the retina, those retinal ganglion cells, they're normal. So they respond normally. It's the connection between the LGN and the cortex that's been disrupted in this case. Yes? The scale is also really confusing. Number seven is up to 20 meters. I feel like it's going on the first graph. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so this is a, so these are numbers of cells activated. So the whole population, you'd have to kind of add up all of those columns. <coughs> um, I think the important thing is that there aren't any over here. And of the cells they recorded, which would, would have been like 20 plus however many this is, 24, that they were all um, ipsilateral, non-deprived sensitive, only responding to the non-deprived eye, and none of them were responding to the deprived eye. <coughs> okay, so let's do another experiment. Okay. Yes. Does that mean it's totally blind in the eye that's the So the eye is itself is not blind because when you open it and you record from the ganglion cells, the ganglion cells respond to light. Mm -hmm. If you record from the LGN to which those neurons project, those respond to light. It's the connection between the LGN and the cortex that is disrupted. Yeah, and I and you know, I'm not showing that here. You have to take that report. So would that mean like they wouldn't be able to see if you still have like pain that So what so what that means is let's see, I don't know if we have it here, uh, but I'll probably show this in a couple of slides. But so that what that means is that if you you know, if you sort of close the eye the, that has been non deprived, so you open the one that you had closed and you cover the other one, mm -hmm. the animal's effectively If the eyes are open for a longer period of time, say another two and a half months, will that fix it? Um, in this case, uh, so if you deprive at eye opening and leave it deprived for two and a half months, we're actually recording you know, a long, more than two years later. Okay, so it's had plenty of time. And that gets us, wait, okay, you're gonna have you hold your questions because I think we're gonna answer them in the next couple of slides. Okay, if you repeat this later, so you don't suture until 12 months, okay, so the animal is essentially an adult, and you cover one eye, and you leave it covered, and then you <coughs> open it and test it. You, have a sh you also have a shift, but it's a much smaller shift. So we just kind of flip back and forth. This is normal. This is what happens if you deprive a juvenile animal for a couple of months. And this is what happens if you deprive an adult animal for years. Okay, so you do get a reduction in the sensitivity, but you still have lots of sensitivity to both eyes. Okay, and the conclusion that we make from this is that the plasticity that's responsible for forming these circuits is uh, that the juvenile <coughs> cortex is much, much more plastic than the adult cortex. Okay, and this brings us to our next experiment. Okay, and then I'll, I'll stop for questions then. Okay, the next experiment is, you know, how little of a deprivation can you do at those early time points and still see an effect? And it turns out that you really can do it for just a couple of days in the juvenile animal. So here the, the timeline has changed a little bit. This is zero to two months. And if you just close the eyes for three days in the middle of that early period, you can see a big decline in the binocularity. If you do it for six days, you've shifted 
to the non-deprived <coughs> eye almost entirely. So it really takes like less than a week at this very early stage to get the non-deprived eye to basically just take over the cortical real estate. Okay, and this is where we get into this idea that there's a critical period. There's a period during that juvenile stage where all of this wiring is going on, where all of this plasticity is going on. And if you disrupt it during that stage, um, you're in trouble. That you can essentially become uh, blind in the deprived eye. This is called uh, so. This is called a critical period. Okay, and it's a time of very extreme sensitivity to the deprivation. In, a, in an adult, this would do essentially nothing. Right? Okay, let me look ahead. I'm kind of running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, we're still talking about this plasticity, so. The structure and the function of the cortex really depends on experience dependent plasticity during this juvenile critical period. Okay, again, you know, the changes are not at the retina level, they're not at the thalamus level. This is really a cortical effect. Okay, and so you can induce what's called, uh, considered a cortical blindness. It's not retinal, it's cortical, um, uh, uh, with the term ablamopia um, as the, the term for this. If you look at the projections between the thalamus and the cortex, okay, so here is uh, the layers of the cortex. Here's layer four, which is our standard input layer. Um, in, um, under the case of the short-term monocular deprivation, so just like the, the few eyes, uh, if you look at the projections of the, of the, le of the again, it's the thalamus of the open eye, you have a normal, uh, elaboration. These are the <laughs> synaptic arborization. This is these are the synaptic terminals that are contacting the cortical neurons. If you look at the terminals of the thalamic inputs from the deprived eye, they're uh, much sparser and weaker. Okay, so you can see these changes um, on the level of those projections from the thalamus to the cortex. And then you see this at very short periods and at long periods. In longer periods doesn't really make you much worse. Um, it all, it's all happening at those really short periods. Okay. And if we go back to our idea of Hebb's postulate, so remember Donald Hebb proposed <coughs> that neurons that fire together fire together. Sorry, the other way. Neurons that fire together wire together. And so the idea is that if you have a set of inputs, you know, so say this is the set of inputs from one eye, and this is a set of inputs from the other eye. Yes and then you measure the output firing, that the inputs that best match the outputs, remember the timing of the inputs and the outputs are incredibly important, that you can have strengthening of the synapses that correlate with the output, and a weakening of synapses that are driven, that either aren't driven, uh, so that they're weak, they're not providing inputs, or they're driven in an uncorrelated way. So here these inputs are correlated with the outputs. These inputs are not correlated with the outputs, and so you have a strength and a selective strengthening of the inputs. And so these inputs now basically take over and are driving the target neuron even more, so there's even greater correlation between these, even less correlation between those weak inputs, and so you're basically eliminating the weaker inputs. And so we can use this idea just to reiterate, this is the Hebb's postulate that coordination and activity between the inputs and the target neuron strength and selectively strengthen the synapses. And that's how activity can basically have one set of synapses take over and the other set of synapses are lost. So this is kind of a use it or lose it. So, so this can happen also, um, uh, and I think we'll just have two more slides here. This can happen when you have uh, not just complete covering of the eye, which basically reduces activity enormously. It also happens when the inputs are not properly coordinated. So 
you know, here's sort of your normal situation. If you have a strabismus, which means that one of your eyes is, um, your eyes are not focusing on the same point, it's often called a lazy eye. Um, lots of people have this, two to three percent of kids have a lazy eye. And if it's severe enough, it means that there's a lack of coordination in the inputs between these two eyes. And so you can get a severe decline in the binocularity. So basically you have very, very few neurons that respond to both eyes because the activity coming from those eyes is completely uncoordinated. Okay, so you still have vision, right? You have responsivity to one eye or responsivity to the other, but not the two of them together. And so this is something that you can, um, you can kind of test uh, in kids, and you have to catch it early, right? Because kids, human kids, like cats, have uh, critical periods. And if you don't catch it early, you can uh, develop uh, vision problems. And so this was an example um, you know, where basically you can uh, measure uh, something called the visually evoked potentials, or VEPs. Okay, so this is basically a simple, non-invasive assessment of visual processing. So you put a little sticker on the kid's head, and you let them watch a program. You cover one eye, and you measure. You cover the other eye, and you measure. And you make sure that both of those eyes are um, getting information to the cortex. So it's not a retinal problem. Cortical problem. This is a cortical measure. So just for fun, I want to kind of show you an example. But before I start this, are, are there any? Let me take questions first. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do? If you do catch it early. What do you do to fix it? Um, uh, I think in some cases. What you do is you end up patching the, uh, the, the, the dominant eye. Usually what happens is you have one eye that kind of wanders off, and you have a dominant eye. And almost elves have some dominant eye. Um, and so I think often what happens is you basically patch the dominant eye, and you force a kid to, to use their non-dominant eye. Um, hmm? <coughs> however long it takes. <laughs> Not, probably not years. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Dr. Quinlan like pretty much said that the critical she kinda like overturned this notion. It's not really a critical period because you can dark the dash individuals that have been deprived of the child yeah. and when they're adults and they actually like can develop this again. Right. Right. So, yeah, so um so the question was uh, Dr. Quinlan, who's one of the faculty here, has been working on ways to basically regain the kind of plasticity. So we saw in the, the CAD experiments that if you uh, deprive the eye